discussion here uh, with you guys regarding, well, of course, what is it out there that we should eat in the future? And, uh, you know, how do we do this in the urban environments where we all, where we all sit? So, so I'll, I'll give you, you know, a couple of seconds each to reflect upon that question. Meanwhile, introducing you, I mean, should I turn to you first, Shefina? Okay, yeah, of course. Uh, so you want me to say my point of view? Or yeah, well, I... where, where is hospitality going? I think for me, uh, it's more and more important about uh, uh, the sustainability, but also the relationship between in all the lines of the business with my customer, my guests, and also my producer, for me, that, that is the future to be more and more uh, loyal to uh, your values, I would say. So the value-based uh, chefing or sort of say, cooking. Um, that, that's well, my point of view. But Sava, you, you're a part of this, right? Because you're, you're, you're a farmer and, uh, and you also supply for a lot of your goods, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So do you feel that you are an intrinsic part of this whole puzzle of absolutely yeah it, it, it's basically um, different food actors working on their own uh, but also together as a team uh, producers growing the food uh, fresh produce harvested only five kilometers away from uh, uh, NG's restaurant where Frida can take the produce and be creative creative with it on this on the spot and basically just serve it for the end consumers Hmm. That's cool. And, and Jens, of course, uh, being the head of InBev, one of the largest brewing companies in the world, uh, and, and you're heading up, of course, the, all the operations up here in the north. And um, where do you see this going? Is this the direction? Would you like to see even larger and fewer restaurants that you could serve in a very efficient way with huge trucks? Or is the future of hospitality the closer, the more sustainable? I think I see, I would distinguish two trends. I think one is the hopefully short term COVID situation, and then there's the mid to long term. And some things of the short term might also impact the long term, right? So, what we see now is more lunch offers, what we see now is more food delivery. We see less people to people interaction where, you know, we would order more and more on the screens. Yeah. And I think there we need. I think the hospitality is yet to find the right balance of person-to-person -person interaction versus mm -hmm. to automation interaction. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do believe in is that the growing conscious of sustainability, the growing conscious of healthiness, which I think in Sweden is already quite ahead, mm -hmm. um, will have the impact that more and more consumers are demanding for seasonal ingredients, sustainably produced ingredients, regional ingredients, mm -hmm. and organic. So this is something that I, 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 I do believe they want choice, authentic, authenticity in both where the food comes from and also what the food is. Hmm. I, I talk, that, that is, of course, sweet music to, to love ears out there. Um, Peter, uh, you're in New York, right? What's the, what's the current situation in New York these days? So I, I think New York is interesting. I, I went out this past weekend and there was amazing amount of activity at restaurants because they've just recently made um, outdoor dining permanent in New York throughout the whole year. And so people have invested a lot of time and effort and money in building out and experiences that are outdoors, which I think will be part of the future. We'll see how those work in the dead of winter, uh, probably not as well. But I think that's really interesting. And, and in a city like New York, some of the trends were already really making hospitality challenging because of rents and costs and the margins that food delivery services take. And so this is a little bit of a reset button, uh, restart kind of thing. And so I think what you're going to see is, is a very different version of the restaurant and hospitality industry. And some of that will be around how do you source more locally? How do you produce food that is not relying on these big Cisco food systems, but actually going back to local vendors? But also, how do you create an experience for customers that is a mix of delivery in restaurant, 
some other sort of experience. There was a chef uh, named Daniel Burns who in my neighborhood during the lockdown was using Instagram to promote twice a week. He was a, a Michelin starred chef. He would do one meal on Thursday and one meal on Sunday. You would order, you would see it on Instagram, you would Venmo him the money, and he had a utility bike that he would ride around the neighborhood and drop off the meals at. Now, that's not scalable, but it's an interesting example of how people were adapting to a very different environment. And Peter, I must ask you then, um, before we let some of our entrepreneurs come in and, and do a small mm -hmm. demos here, um, I mean, you're heading up FoodX, uh, arguably the first uh, food tech accelerator out there in the world, and you've seen a bunch of these new innovations come and go over the years. Uh, have you seen lately, so to say, a new category of innovations coming coming up? Yeah, I think as it relates to to hospitality, for sure, we're seeing a lot of people look at the success that meal delivery services and frankly meal kits that were trending very badly downward are now sort of trending back upward because of how much people are cooking at home but you're seeing people take a look at the problems with those existing companies with the door dashes and the grub hubs and uh, delivery heroes of the world and say what's a model that's actually more fair for both the owner of the restaurant and the consumer and how do we build systems that go back to more of a SaaS model as opposed to a marketplace model where they're taking a huge chunk of it so we're seeing some interesting stuff there and then also i think in the food as medicine space um, especially given how underlying conditions can make coronavirus that much worse we're seeing a lot of people figure out ways to um, create food products that supplant some of the need for supplements and down the road even some pharmaceuticals. Hmm. Uh, shall we try and see if we can get one of our uh, one wonderful entrepreneurs to come in and do a demo for us? We believe that food is love. We believe that food and cooking is not just the great food itself, but a central piece of the human connection. It's about culture, where the passion for cooking brings people together, and about making connections and sharing stories. My name is Marie-Louise, and I'm co-founder of Nanshot Co. So allow me to put you in the right frame of mind. Imagine yourself 10 years ago, when you could either drive yourself or you pay for a cab. Today, there is a third way, that is Uber. And 10 years ago, when you travel, you could either stay with a friend or you pay for a hotel. Today, Airbnb is that third way that strives to be more authentic and cost-effective. Today, though, when you have lunch at work, you either bring your own or you pay for professional food. We believe in a third way. Welcome to lunch.co, a fun and smart way to enjoy food at work while getting to know your colleagues. So it's essentially a platform where colleagues can buy and sell home-cooked food at work. Now, this is smart because you eat real food, homemade from scratch, you earn and you save money, and you can also waste less by cooking tasty meals of food that would otherwise have gone to waste. Did you know that 75% of food waste is happening in our households? And it's fun. You can get inspired and improve your cooking skills, and you can discover new authentic dishes and flavors, and it opens up for a new and fun way to get to know your colleagues. So. Let's look at how it works. So this is Sophie. She's cooking some tasty chicken pasta, one of her favorite recipes. And then she packages it nicely, she takes a photo, and she posts it on the app. The next morning when she goes to work, she brings the food and she then puts it in the communal fridge. This is John, her colleague. He's hungry, opens up the app, scrolls what's available and find something he likes and can conveniently buy it with one snip. He can then conveniently pick it up and enjoy his lunch together with his colleagues. So up to today, we have had a variety with over 200 different dishes with a taste and quality rating of 8.3 and at a 40% discount to the professionally catered offerings. We are today live across Sweden and we're now opening up to new workplaces. 
So, how does lunch look like in your office tomorrow? Come join us. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Maria. So, a new take on lunch, right? So, but the chefs here, do you think this or is this an opportunity? I wouldn't say it's an enemy. I prefer people to eat proper cooked food and uh, fast food or other things that people go out for for quick lunch. So, I think it's a super nice way of uh, getting people to cook more and get more interested into food. That's right. Some of you agree? Uh, definitely, yeah. This is uh, very similar to uh, when, let's say, as an example, I was uh, growing some microgreens uh, at home and uh, I would uh, harvest freshly grown microgreens from my home, pack it in my lunchbox, go to the office, and then people would ask, hey, what is that uh, you're eating there? And then there would be a new line of communication about uh, what it means to grow food in the middle of the city, in your own home, on your kitchen counter, uh, and having access to freshly grown, uh, super nutritious, super food to include or implement in your uh, daily diet. But that's really interesting because you don't really only have to cook the stuff, you could just bring the microgreens to your For sure. fellow yeah, workers, right? right? Yeah. Could, could you also brew things and bring to your fellow workers, or is this where you come in, yes? <laughs> Well, we need to see. I think there are, you also have legislative <laughs> questions that arise. Uh, yeah, but no, I think it's a, it's a wonderful it's a, it's a wonderful idea. Um, something I will show into. Uh, we have only a small office, but uh, at least you know who you cook for, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, 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 but it's interesting because suddenly we have started to think food outside the the normal box in a way. Um, and Marius, I think one of all your colleagues explained to me that uh, since you're based both in Sweden and the UK. That, that was something around 35% of all the restaurants were threatened by COVID, by you know, either just closing down because there were no customers or long-term having to close down because they can only have you know, limited, limited seating in the restaurants. So, so, so it's kind of, okay. And then you think of it, where do I go to eat? Do I have to bring my own lunchbox? And I'm a lousy cook. Uh, you know, suddenly perhaps we can experience more professionalism in the kitchen or in, in, on our plates. And I guess that's one of the, you know, probably things we're going to experience going forward. But Andrew, uh, sorry, Andrew, you're not here. No, you're not here yet. Okay. Peter, would you invest in Lunch.com? Well, so we have an investment that's sort of competitive that came out of uh, India where they have this sort of cultural norm was already there, but now we're seeing a lot more of these pop up globally because it's becoming more culturally acceptable in countries across the globe. So um, this is the type of business we would look at for sure. Okay, lovely. Andrew, it's so good to have you here. Andrew. Uh, <laughs> no, because we were longing to have you. Yeah, it's a technology. Good that we're working with food, right? Um, and we've been speaking here about, of course, the food, uh, the food, uh, hospitality sector of the future. Um, and you, I mean, like you are one of the big investors into the next gen, cell grown, plant based type of foods. And um, what do you think about uh, plant based and cell grown? What, what type of what type of role will they play in the future hospitality sector? Yeah, uh, I think that's driven very much by how good the entrepreneurs are at creating great tasting food at a price that's competitive and, uh, you know, working effectively with uh, with thought leaders like the restaurateurs. We've seen, for example, Impossible leveraging the restaurant sector as a great way of engaging with the community and getting their products tested and getting their products to the point where you know, people are, are seeing them as a central part of their diet. Uh, so I think the restaurant sector at, uh, in particular is one of the kind of uh, drivers or thought leaders of this movement um, around plant-based and as cell-based becomes more commercialized around cell-based also. So yeah, incredibly important. It, this isn't just a, a grocery sector phenomenon. Um, it's being led by the the thought leaders in the restaurant space uh, as a way of uh, engaging consumers. Cool, because this is not just about new products, it's also about constantly developing new products and recipes and how you can use these new well tools in the kitchen. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just as we think about um, urban growing and urban farms as a way of, of getting, you know, food closer to people and, and fresher food closer to people and into, into restaurants, into, you know, people's homes and mouths, um, plant-based is and cell-based is, is a way of, of bringing more uh, food more efficiently to people than, you know, the typical animal farming uh, supply chain, which we saw with COVID is more fragile than we ever anticipated. So, you know, the, uh, having, for example, cell-based means that there will come a point of time where we not only have uh, uh, the ability to grow, you know, leafy greens in urban environments, but we also will have the ability to grow meat and fish and all sorts of other kind of cell-based uh, animal protein derivatives in, in an urban environment. You're not limited then by having a farm or having a big factory filled with, you know, crammed pigs, chickens, and, and, and beef. You can actually grow the same meat without the skeleton and the animal involved in urban environments. Uh, it can be at, almost at source or, or where you need to use the you know use the product so you just you know just like growing leafy greens we're going to see a transformation with cell based over the next 10 years where we can grow that meat um, in the middle of a city and bring it fresh ready to use ready to consume approve assuming you know the relevant authorities approve it uh, and and they're going to approve it in asia within the next 12 months um, it won't be long until uh, I hope Europe follows suit. If America can stop being quite so political, maybe at some point in, at some point in the next decade, we might see it here too. <laughs> I've avoided talking about that thus far, but after last night, it's hard <laughs> not to. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, 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 but when we look at, for instance, cell grown, I know, uh, Saba, you're what do you think about cell ground, for instance? Do you think is that real food or is it doof? Um, I think um, it's yeah, it's it's a challenging question to really answer because uh, I I wouldn't want to make a, co a negative comment about uh, putting uh, brains together to figure out how we're gonna uh, source our food in the future. I I'm extremely against animal factories, of course. Uh, so. When it comes to different um, methods used in order to bring food production closer and closer to where most people live in uh, metropolitan cities, I think any technique that is used, whether it's hydroponics, aquaponics, farming, uh, vertical farming in shipping containers, uh, rooftop farming, or in this particular uh, situation, uh, investing money in uh, cell growth uh, meat. Yeah. Uh, why not? Um, why not? But but you think, Andrew? Let me just ask you here: Is do you think that that cell grown will be, you know, one giant, enormous bioreactor cranking out the one and only protein? Uh, or, or, or beat cells, or will there be many, many, many different? That's a, that, that, that's a great question. Um, in terms of the kind of pro animal protein that we consume, so, you know, fish, uh, well, let's, you know, mammalian, ovarian, et cetera, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We, we as a human population consume about 70, sorry, 7,000 different species and types of animal protein. 7,000. In terms of cell base today, they're leveraging around about 10 different uh, species. We've got a long way to go. Um, these things will only ever work if we give consumers what they want and what they need and what they culturally uh, have been culturally grown up to want and appreciate. So we, we you know, we're going to need to be just as complex um, in terms of the cell based meat that we deliver to consumers. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Um, we've, you know, for example, we've got a company that's working on um, Hamon Serrano. Uh, so, you know, uh, Pata Negra from Spain, uh, a very, very complex, multi structured kind of uh, cell based uh, meat product, um, which addresses what consumers in Spain are, are you know, using on a regular basis. Um, we, the only way this is going to work as if it's not just about meatballs uh, like Memphis Meat is currently producing, but, you know, recognizes the complexity of palates and culture uh, and how people consume food today. That's the only way it's going to work. Yeah. Okay, so that, that means that cell grown companies are really more like artisanal farmers and bakers than, than big food manufacturing factories well so i think i think we're going to get there 
I think we'll ju just like we have, a, uh, you know, across the animal protein industry, we have mass produced chickens in billions, you know, every, and slaughtered on a daily basis. Um, we will have companies producing chicken on mass. Likewise, we will have companies in the cell based space creating uh, uh, pata negra. We'll have them producing foie gras. We'll have them producing pretty much everything you can think about uh, in the animal protein sector, but using cell based. Uh, that's you know where and we'll have big companies we'll have medium-sized companies and we'll have small companies um it's just a matter of time the two the, the kind of barrier the two key barriers to getting there right now are growth factor which is typically right now fetal bovine serum which is an incredibly expensive um uh, a, 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 you know necessary ingredient we've got a company working on a plant-based version of that which is 50 times less expensive than fetal bovine serum that should open up the whole industry. The second is around scaffolding, uh, and there are multiple companies tackling that scaffolding uh, problem using, you know, uh, all sorts sorts of different natural ingredients. So I think we're getting there. And and this was all started, you know, really by a company that SOSV invested in with Memphis Meat. They've really kind of paved the way, and now there are other companies very quickly following on and and innovating right behind them. That's very well. Yes, for all you know, scaffolding is that's how you build the structure of the Correct. meat. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that that's really an enormous amount of development going on there. Peter, I, I'll give you a tricky question here. Uh, okay. You have you have hundred million US. You want to invest that so it returns the mass the most over the next three year period and the next ten year period. What do you invest in? Uh, the solution to bring farmers uh, closer to urban dwellers, or do you invest in um, uh, cell grown? So, uh, uh, if those are my two choices. <laughs> yeah, that's great. For now, if, yeah. if you want to add your choice, please do. But I want well, you to add to that. Well, we'll have an urban farmer sitting here. So. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> let's, see, let's see what you can choose there. But he can't right. reach you, so. so. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think in the short term, the urban agriculture side of this is going to be way more important in the very short term in that two to three year period, whereas cellular agriculture is a much, much bigger opportunity, but it's it's got regulatory hurdles, it's got technological hurdles, it's got scaling hurdles, all of which are going to get worked out, but that may take five years, that may take it may take 12 months, probably not. It may take five years, it may take 10 years. Somewhere in there is when it's going to be, the, the old saying, the future happens very slowly and then all at once. You know, We're gonna be talking about this, talking about this, and then suddenly it's gonna be ubiquitous in all of our grocery stores. Sarah, you have a comment there. Uh, sure thing, yeah. I, I'd like to make a comment about the time uh, period that you're looking at. Um, for instance, one of the projects that we work at in the company that I'm uh, hired at, Boti in uh, Malmö, south of Sweden, is that uh, we have urban farming incubators there. Okay, so during the winter months, we recruit people who are interested in getting into commercialized uh, urban agriculture practices and starting up uh, urban farming enterprises. So we basically, during these incubator uh, programs, we help them to adopt an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mindset and uh, kind of deploy that towards uh, starting up their urban farms within city limits okay so within uh, five let's say three to five year period there is massive uh, potentials for uh, entrepreneurs who are interested in becoming one of the one of these food actors growing food locally for the community for the for the local chefs or families uh, that opportunity should not be taken lightly, in my opinion. Um, and specifically when it comes to urban agriculture practices mixed with organic agriculture principles, uh, with the way that we grow food within city limits, uh, you, can, uh, you can potentially grow seven tons of food on 1,500 square meter of space. This is uh, the exact number that we've come up to yep. for the last two years uh, that we started this farm uh, in the middle of uh, the third largest city in Sweden. So when you look at that, um, when you when you give access to uh, land or rooftops, balconies, 
uh, unused pieces of land that could potentially be used for yep. agriculture purposes. Uh, it's going for his agenda. Yeah. I think this is this is interesting because it's you now I think everyone is united in this this room and and and, and of course out there as well uh, around the theme that you can grow things through the type of rooftop gardens that you have or through cell ag, but the ones who are dying are the mono big monoculture big you know big food. That, that, that's really in trouble over the next uh, next decade or so, uh, which of course is a really interesting dynamic. This Let, let's bring in another entrepreneur here, Hi, Ruslana. So good to meet you, at least. Um, so Ruslana here uh, is uh, one of our, of course, fantastic new entrepreneurs. Go straight to the goodies here and show us what you have here. Sure. So my name is Ruslanas. I'm the founder of Milo Appliances, and uh, we believe that we are creating the kitchen of the future. And today I'll show you how it will look like. So basically, as uh, the spaces are getting smaller and smaller, the of the kitchen appliances becomes really important. And the, the future kitchen appliances will seamlessly integrate in, in our home interiors. Today we're going to cook pancakes real quick. I'll drop off. Thank you. We love pancakes. By the way, do you need an apron in the future? Or uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in the in the future, well, obviously all the all, all the kitchen appliances will be smart, and you will be able to highly personalize the way you interact with the appliance, and also the appliance will learn the way you interact and adapt over the time. So I'm switching the induction right now. Also, the multifunctionality uh, of the appliances will be very important uh, because we'll have less storage. So obviously, it's very convenient. We have a built-in blender here, which operates uh, via magnets. So this is our unique technology, magnetic air drive. So basically, we're able to transfer strong torque through the air, through the uh, base to the top and this is just an example instead of a blender we can have like a juicer grinder chopper any any device that needs the rotation can, okay, can be so, so you're running this uh, blender on your induction uh, we right now we have uh, two separate technologies this one is the magnetic air drive so basically we uh, we can transfer the torque from the motor via magnets to the accessory. So this accessory is uh, for blending one. And right here we have an induction also built in uh, separately. Hmm. Okay. That's really cool. And what is really important that they actually, you know, with this technology, we are replacing, uh, we're replacing a lot of range of accessories that you would normally use in your kitchen because we're using the same motor and with the additional accessories, we can have like, like all applications. So blending, juicing, grinding with just one water, with one controls. So it's, it's very difficult. It's very different and it's very sustainable from the very starting point of not producing uh, appliances that you don't need. Okay. What do you say about that? Uh, how many sciences do you have in the kitchen that you don't oh, use? I, I don't know. Too many, apparently. <laughs> Looks cool. Or, or, or you only make pancakes. I never make pancakes. I'm really crappy on pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> because you have the wrong blender. Yeah. Need a new blender. So, so basically, our main goal is uh, right now is to connect uh, two type of energy, the kinetic energy and thermal er energy, into one spot. So basically, we'll be able to, in the future, we'll be able to process the food and cook the food in one in one spot in a in a smart port. So very similar in terms of functionality to uh, Thermomix or Bosch Cook It, where everything is happening in, in, in one place. Okay, super cool. Wonderful, Rasmanas. That seems really, I think, a really cool technology. And I think we have Ofer here now with us. Ofer, hey. so good to see you finally. Yeah, thanks. I had a, a bit of a technical issues, but I'm glad uh, uh, we got it working out. Uh, just uh, for a second, if try to share my screen as well. If you can, uh, Roslana, please stay with us. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah. 
so kitchen robotics sounds like yeah um can i go right ahead sure go ahead well uh kitchen robotics okay um basically uh, i i won't give you video footage if any one of you would like to uh, the audience would like to see the video footage you can go you can go directly robo.com now let's talk about what we are actually doing the, the problem we are trying to handle is that restaurants and food chains and even hotels and delivery service providers are constantly on a struggle especially now uh, there are sanitary and hygiene issues profitability issues even dish a preparation consistency issue as well as availability issues um actually what kitchen robotics is all about we are trying to automate dark kitchens to enable clean and effective production and delivery of a, a, a diversified types of dishes uh, very uh, more than a single kind how how, how do how, how do we handle that now, now may, our main hardware is called the bistro the bistro consists basically of uh, in parts. The first part we call it the uh, collecting part, where you collect the various ingredients using a pot that traverses through the system. On the second part, we actually cook the ingredients. You can see on the top the induction panels where the the pot is rotating. On the third part, uh, manual plating. Uh, uh, it's a manual plating part where an actual person takes the dish out of the uh, 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 out of the pot and uh, packs it. And the fourth part, which is actually very important, is the clinic part. So the the operator won't have the need uh, uh, to um, to manage any cleaning at all. So, cool. so how, okay. So how many how many people do you do you uh, take away with that robot? So, uh, Basically, we can reduce the back of house from seven people to somewhere between one and two. Depends on the time, it just depends on the load. Um, as you can see, a, a good question uh, is a question side on it. So, uh, uh, the darkness within the, the cloud robotic era. So basically, obviously, the the the, the uh, cooking is is more hygiene. We reduced labor more than 50%. And uh, one of the, the key aspects that I want to show today is that it's how dishes can be easily programmed, updated, and distributed around the system. Uh, because I wanted to give some hands on experience on actually what's going behind in the collection of the actual robots. Okay. So, the screen from which is uh, the actual management, the actual brains of, of the bistro. It's called Quizmo. Okay? And you can see in the screen how easily we can prepare a single dish with just and the right amount. And we decide uh, how long to cook it uh, and, and what speed and temperature. Okay? And that's it. About, that, that's about assume that the dish is easily prepared, then, well, uh, there is no that it will be it will constantly the same dish every no matter where you it. Not only we can program a single dish, we have the capability of finding multiple options for modifying the dish, something that is much more troubling for a human chef. For example, we can modify every single ingredient to make it uh, healthier or with less fat, um, and uh, are a lot of hundreds of options are available as long as we have the space with the ingredients in the system. The, the okay, but, but, but oh, Robert, this is uh, uh, sorry to, to push you and rush you a little here, but but uh, since we're running out slightly of time, I, I have a couple of questions here, so okay. Who do you really enhance here? Is it the the restaurant or is it actually the farmer? I mean, like, with, if if you if you have a super chef in the form of a robot, then you just have to be a farmer, and then you can be a restaurateur. Exactly. If you control, well, as we see it, that that the more 
well, obviously, the uh, type of system is not suitable for Michelin stars restaurant, but the, the QSR world, the, the quick service and fast world, which is probably about 80, 90 percent uh, of the ecosystem, in, in that world, what we see is the quality of ingredients, the better the results, that the cooking is the important issue. And the farmer, in this case, if he provides the proper and better ingredients, then uh, we can easily provide better alternatives and cheaper alternatives for the uh, end. Okay, super cool. Offer. Uh, hang on for a second. Uh, I'm going to let in Vembla into this one as well. Uh, Leslie, are you here? Offer. I'm sorry. I, I... You were meant to stay. <laughs> Let's hi, see. Hi. But, yeah, hi, Leslie. Uh, please uh, take it away. What, what is Bembla doing? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to give you a quick presentation. So, Bembla is the hyper local deliveries for grocery and pharma. And I'm Leslie. So, Bembla was founded in April 2019, and its purpose was to simplify the grocery shopping in a sustainable way. It's Nordic's first on-demand grocery delivery app, and it was the first to deliver 100% electric. So we were using our signature bikes, like you can see in the photo, primarily. We had a rushed commercial launch earlier than expected in March uh, to support the COVID-19. And uh, this COVID-19 spikes have made this 2% online growth, which is the amount of penetration when we first started, really spike. And it's, uh, it's, it's caused some pain for the stores, for the local shops, putting some severe stress on these grocery stores. Uh, it also showed a lot of strong gaps that Bembla is able to solve for the customers and us as our customer needs. We're looking at some proven business models. Uh, we're taking the best of these proven cases that exist in North America, Asia, Europe. Um, but we're also listening to the unique customer needs that we have here. And we've had extremely strong traction. So Vembla has been able to gather both real user cases and market fits with their viable solution and identify um, clear target groups, which uh, we're using for our next generation of Vembla that's currently underway. So what I'd like to do now is show you our data-driven um, data sustainable shopping service and the benefits that you have for the local stores, the customers, and the youth employment. So this is going to feel quite familiar. I'm going to show you the customer app. And uh, one thing that we're, uh, is really unique is Vembla is showing a variety of local stores in the neighborhood. And it's, uh, having, um, it's allowing the shops to have their entire inventory. Some stores are having up to 30,000 items and they can have specialty items that they might have unique to their store something that other warehouse providers are not able to do for these local stores today and something uh, we're really proud of being able to help the stores to offer to their customers and as the, as, as the customers to have more selection. Then I'm not going to show you this like behind the scenes view of the shopper view. This is also really cool because it shows how we can onboard gigsters in a really great way, um, spending time to train them on the best uh, produce to to choose and it gives them their work instructions everything they need in one place so they can do their complete job it also has an intelligent learning so if they need a replacement it makes a suggestion but lets them call or make a video discussion with the customer for a special request to make sure that's what they really need and you have all your delivery information even a way for the customer to talk to the shoppers and say for example as in that demo you just saw that their baby was sleeping so I think uh, this is really exciting. This is the team. So it's uh, people with strong background in other startups, uh, technology, the industry, and marketing. Our business model is we're taking from uh, kickbacks from the stores. We're having delivery fees for the customers uh, set at the price scale that they are willing to pay and that fits their needs. And then we work with FMCG brands. So, for example, the Ben & Jerry partnership we recently begun, which uh, lets us do data promotion with them. It's been okay. 10,000 orders yeah. already delivered in the last six months. Lovely. Okay, so listen, this, this sounds like you're, you're on the way here of, of actually bringing the total delivery to, uh, to the city of Stockholm here. I think it's interesting, actually, to, to, to be honest, because in a city like London, which of course is home of delivery, uh, there are so many new types of not just delivery services, but also offerings 
from the hospitality sector and, and others out there that suddenly are enabled through a new infrastructure. And I guess you guys see that too, you know, that M InBev, right? So with new types of infrastructure, things change. And, and Ofer, you, you, you think the same, right? Because once we start deploying these types of machines out there, we will start cooking in new ways. We will cook new dishes probably. Hopefully we can even throw out the bad shit and, and get easier to cook but healthier things to people. Hopefully they're delivered by a Bembla bike, right? Um, you know, Peter, now you have uh, a bunch of companies to invest in. Uh, how, can, how can we make sure that, that uh, you know, you take the best of Sweden, bring it to the US, educate them properly and then bring them back again because we don't want to lose them forever. Well, it's, should we go? It's, it's, a, it, it's a lot easier now because everything we do is virtual at the moment. So nobody has to come to New York even at this point. Um, but I will say, I think what, what Vinva is doing is very interesting because grocery is not an early adopter industry or retail in general. And so they were kind of, we have a couple of companies in the retail tech space and the big retailers were all saying, no, it's, it's cool, but it's not really top of mind for us. And all of a sudden with COVID, that's accelerated things dramatically. So when you were asking me about short term versus long term, I think this is one of those short term areas that also branches into long term opportunity. Uh, if people, and unfortunately I have to drop off in just a second for another yeah. call, but if people are interested in finding out more about FoodX, it's food-x.com. Uh, I'm Peter Bodenheimer, or PJB at foodx.com. But at the end of the day, it's about companies that are going to impact beyond just their local market, even if they're starting in their local market, right? So how do they build a model that, whether it's through expansion, licensing, or partnerships, can impact sort of the global supply chain and not just one small market. That's what I think FoodX is most interested in. That's super cool, Peter. And I think that was a really, really good uh, last word here. Um, we have to break now for some coffee, uh, bring the, you know, the level of caffeine up in, in all the participants, not mm. just in the room, around the world. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming here and sharing. Ofer, Roslana, uh, Marie Louise, uh, you know, Leslie. I mean, we'll be back after after a few minutes break with more stuff. Thank you so much, and see you soon again. Cheers. Bye. Hi there. Good to see you again. Back from coffee. That was a quick coffee cup, cup of coffee for me, but uh, at least I, I I got to grab some. Um, now. I'd like to invite Mike uh, Wolf and Kitchen Summit to join me uh, for a little chit chat here regarding uh, the future of services in the city. So let's see here, Mike, how can I get you on board here? You have an invitation. Oh, here you come. Oh, Mike, yeah. so good to see you. It's good to see tech working too. I really, yeah. love, I really love that. So, uh, so tell me, where, where in the world are you? I'm coming to you from Seattle here on the West Coast. It's about six in the six thirty in the morning. God, I, 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 so you really needed my cup of coffee. I'm talk. dedicated. I'm dedicated for you, Johan. I wanted to chat with your community. Uh, I've been enjoying uh, watching the conversation and seeing a lot of familiar faces like Peter Bodenheimer and Andrew Ives. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, it, it's uh, it's a uh, to some extent, I guess it's a small world at the same time as it is, of course, a huge planet uh, where we're all, you know, sharing the same destiny. Destiny, right? Uh, so, so tell me, I mean, like you've been running the Kitchen Summit and uh, for quite a while, and you're really, really engaged in the question on what's happening in the culinary world out there. So, uh, and, and new things, everything from robotics to new business models for, for hospitality sector. I mean, and at the same time, we see a lot of development there, of course, but we see a lot of problems also. Uh, you know, cities like New York virtually closing down, same with London, a bunch of others. So what do you say, uh, Mike? What's the status and where are we going from here? 
I mean, I think what COVID has done is reinforced just how fragile the legacy food ecosystem is. And, you know, we've seen, we saw cracks in the system. We kind of knew they were there, but they were really shown on the bright light of day when COVID uh, came and really jolted the system. So, but what I will say is what's been inspiring being involved in the food tech and food innovation community is you've seen really a rallying up and down the food value chain. Uh, whether it's people at food retail and food restaurants trying to quickly digitize their their business models and pivot to new ways to touch the consumer. That's been exciting. Um, you've also seen investors like the Andrew Ives of the world and the Pete and Bodenheimers really uh, getting more excited. And you've seen a lot of money, quite honestly. I've been surprised how much money's been invested in new food companies. Um, uh, you've seen the alternative protein guys, the, the fermentation guys. Uh, there's been like almost an acceleration of investment. And then finally, you know, we've all been at home more and we've all seen how more consumers are cooking more. Um, and so I think what the long-term impact of that is, is really been fascinating to watch as someone who studies the food system and how much behavior will go back to the previous behavior versus how much of this is the new normal. And so it's an exciting time to be in food innovation and food tech, as I'm sure you would agree and talking to a lot of these entrepreneurs. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's been a fun, I wouldn't say COVID's been fun, fun but it's been an, an exciting time, a great time to be involved in food innovation. Oh, cool. So, so I mean, uh, what would you say, I mean, of course, innovation has accelerated over the past few, uh, few years. And um, so where do you see the most most things happening these days? I mean, I think the most near term things that we've seen is the digitization and new formats in restaurants. And so restaurants were forced to really rethink how they do business, because if your physical retail space is closed, you have to basically pivot to a new business, an entirely new business model. And so we've seen that. You've also seen companies who are building new technologies that are like, for example, contactless, uh, uh, contactless technology, et cetera, start to have their time, start to have their moment in the sun. So um, I think that's been really interesting. And I think that's where we've seen the most kind of near-term innovation. I think from a longer term perspective, I think we've seen uh, because the, the traditional animal fa factory farming world is really pretty fragile and actually is a potential infection vector for things like viruses, I think the more longer term recreation of the food system is happening upstream there, right? And so you heard some of the folks earlier today talk about that, but I think um, you're definitely going to see people and, and companies exploring new ways in which we can source protein, more sustainable ways and ways which aren't as reliant on factory farming. That's really interesting because uh, when you look at hospitality sector and of course all the professional chefs out there this is what they've been screaming about for for a number of years why do we have to work with the same 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 produce all over it same i mean if, from one perspective i guess it's 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 cool because you will have consistent quality you know the same type of low quality chicken uh, chicken you know going through your restaurants but at the same time you want to have the real stuff to cook with i guess if you're a top chef or if you're caring about the next-gen food system. Um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Well, I mean, I think, and I was listening to Andrew, I've talked earlier, and he talked about how we really have to find products that consumers want, that culturally we've been acclimated in our growing up to, to want. I think um, part of the challenge around a lot of these new future foods will just largely be having this conversation with consumers and getting them to understand it. You're also fighting against incumbents to a certain degree, right? So if you see what impossible... Uh, has been in, engaging with a, almost a PR battle with traditional meat producers and, you know, the, the large meat industrial complex, if you if you could call it that, here in the U.S., has started to almost start a propaganda campaign and saying that Impossible is like not really natural food. There's a lot of additives. It's unhealthy. So um, there's a lot of incumbents. There's a lot of entrenched behavior. And I think ultimately that's going to play out. And then also we have to talk to the consumers and, and educate them about what some of these new products are, because ultimately they're the ones that are going to be buying it. So uh, this is a multi-year process to what Peter Bonnenheimer is saying, saying. This is not something that gets solved overnight, but I think that the pieces are falling in place for a future food system that's, that is exciting. Yeah, 
That's really exciting because it's going to be more about quality, less than uh, rather than perhaps just industrial scale methods. And I think uh, to be, I mean, I, I'm not against industry in any way or, or scaling stuff. You know, my 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 tagline is disruptive and scalable. You know, so so I really love the thing, but but it shouldn't it shouldn't be on the you know ex, so it's like you shouldn't have to sacrifice quality for scaling. You know, you need probably need to get into a food system that is both scalable and healthy and sustainable at the same time. Um, but you know, I think I think what we've seen is that we can probably achieve that. But then we need to talk about, of course, about machinery. What's the what's the coolest stuff that you've seen recently in, in the world of new automation, robotics? That's coming on a you know everywhere now, all fronts. Yeah, I mean, what's you saw uh, earlier the Bistro Cloud Kitchen kitchen robot uh, that we that was uh, you were demoing in the last session. There's been it seems like half jokingly there's a new pizza robot that has been coming out like every week or so. Um, I certainly think acceleration of automation in back of house has been hap has happened over the last six months. A lot of these concepts have been, you know, been in development. If you look at the patent trail over the past five years, there's been like no shortage of big restaurant chains investing in, in new robotic concepts. Um, you've seen startup money going in there or investment money going into startups. Um, so I, I think that's really been interesting. There's also just uh, if you look at the front of house where people actually interface with uh, the people at the restaurant. There's also starting to see some automation there. Um, there's a new robot announced by Bear Robotics just this week. If you've heard of Bear Robotics, they're a startup uh, based out of Northern California. They have a new robot called Servi that is basically a waiter robot um, that, that'll allow you to, that will bring your beers to you, will bring new food to you. And they had a huge investment from SoftBank. So we're seeing automation investment both in front of house and back of house at the restaurant side. We are seeing a little bit in the home. Um, I've seen a new class of startups doing all-in-one automated device, but it's been a lot slower, quite honestly, because um, consumers aren't quite sure if they're ready to start spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on a kitchen robot, and quite honestly, the technology's not there. I definitely think robotics and automation is getting more advanced and getting exciting, particularly in the restaurant space. Hmm, that's really that's that's cool. Because uh, where do you think we're heading? Are we heading for more help in the home to cook better food in the home, or or are we definitely going in the direction of services? I think that it's partly a generational conversation, right? Like if you look at like my kids' age, like they're they're Gen Z, they definitely like this idea of using an app to get food. My daughter orders Uber Eats food with her with her allowance, but. Um, at the same time, we've seen like this for the first time during the pandemic, a lot of these this generation actually cooking for the first time. And, you know, they while they may be using YouTube or an app to to understand how to cook, um, I think that they're also getting excited about cooking. So um, will we have the the all in one cooking robot in the future in the home? I think maybe some homes will, but I think we're going to see appliances like the Thermomix, like the Kenwood Chef. Um, like some uh, these products like the Chef IQ that are basically multifunction devices that automate a lot of the cooking process, but it does have the consumer involved to a certain degree. So um, maybe in 10 years, we'll see like the all-in-one cooking robot. Sony, for example, is developing a, a vision and they're working with some universities to develop like the actual all-in-one cooking robot. But I think that's definitely probably 10 years away. Hmm. So, so where do you think this will lead us uh, going down uh, the path of innovation here? Will we eat better, cheaper, higher quality food in the future, or will these robots just push, you know, even more of the you know bland, standardized food that we're to such a great extent eating today? I mean, I think one of the, the large mega trends in food just just broad, more broadly is just consumers are trying to understand more and, and know where the food is coming from. There's also been a push towards more personalization, so a little bit of a move away from one size fits all food. I think if we were to kind of look at where these trends are going in the future is we're probably going to see higher transparency what is in our food. 
probably higher quality food, uh, but it oftentimes will depend on what the, the consumer can afford. So I think if we could scale some of these new, more sustainable food systems to get lower pricing, I mean, that's certainly what Pat Brown wants to do with Impossible Foods. His vision is to make everyone in the world be able to eat a plant-based burger and do it at an affordable price. Um, you know, if you look at the impossible pricing two years ago, it's like $10 $15 for a burger. Now you can get it at Burger King for $5. So we're moving down that progression path towards lower prices. Um, but I think personalization is a, is a trend we really think is going to be huge. I think more consumers are going to want to map their food diets and then what their food planning is around what their personal bio makeup may be. So um, you're starting to see more uh, wearable devices with information about what your particular bio makeup is for the day. I think that'll be a trend also to keep an eye on. Okay, that's super cool. Okay, Mike, so uh, we need to move on in the program. I, I could speak to you for hours and hours uh, regarding this, but I, I think there's a place you should go, I guess, if you want to learn more about what's happening in the kitchen world. Where should we go? Yeah. You should go to Market to Summit or read the, yeah. or read the spoon. <laughs> No, but that's good. So you should read this book. I do that, uh, and you should go to the Kitchen Summit. And I probably won't do that. Are, are you are you going to be in the virtual realms this year, or we're going completely virtual? Uh, we will be online, so anyone around the globe can come attend. Just go to SmartKitchenSummit.com to learn more. Cool, and um, I'll be there for sure, and see you there. All right, you on. Before. Thank you, everyone. Okay. I, it's been a great event. Thank you. Uh, it was wonderful to have you here and making it great. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Okay. Bye. So uh, we're going into the session of um, uh, a pitching session again here. And so we have a bunch of really cool people. And uh, Mathieu Dispensa already volunteered to be first out here uh, with, of course, the spiritual machine. Mathieu, so good to see you again. <laughs> Glad to see you, Jan. You, you still haven't grown a proper beard, but you're, you're getting there. Yeah. Um, Yep, that's wonderful to see. And the spiritual machine, I'm, I'm going to click here so we make it large. Uh, it looks so good. But Mattia, what is this? Okay, uh, thank you. The spiritual machine, uh, we started uh, uh, some years ago when we produced first uh, our first uh, craft spirit. And we found it, it was a nightmare because it was a lot of time to market and uh, really expensive for the first batch. So what we thought is that... Uh, uh, a spiritual machine was needed and uh, what we have done and uh, working on a platform that can enable every uh, craft spirit producer to have their product in a fast, easy and uh, affordable way. So uh, we are allowing uh, everybody from uh, Michelin star chef to restaurant uh, to innovators uh, to think about their spirit and uh, have the real product uh, with their brand. So we studied more than 150 botanicals and our innovation is that we deconstruct somehow the main spirits like gin, uh, bitter, vermouth, sweet bitter. Let's say that we uh, took, deconstructed the red base of vermouth, like the flower part of gin and the herbal part of amaro. And so we, there are more than 50 blocks and we can uh, combine together creating endless spirits but also uh, traditional spirits. So just to give you an example, uh, we are the company that has produced the highest number of vermouth brands in the world. And that's only the beginning because now we are applying the same process to gin, to whiskey, to rum. And uh, the market, as you know, is huge. It's more than 500 billion uh, of dollars every year. So, and the craft spirits scene is uh, growing really fast. And uh, as we uh, did, so even if our clients were deeply affected by the pandemic, we grow more than 300% uh, year over year. And uh, so we are having uh, good times uh, in this uh, crisis. And I will use my last minute to talk about a project we are doing uh, about circular economy that can sound strange, uh, spirits and circular economy. As you know, wine producers uh, uh, had a lot of problems after the pandemic because they have their cellars full of wine. And that's a problem because uh, especially white wine cannot be aged easily. So they can only distill 
for 0.3 euros per liter. So what we basically do is uh, take un thousands of liters from them, so they have uh, free space for uh, new production, and uh, transform it into vermouth, that is 80% white wine, send them back their bottles uh, with their vermouth that has a longer shelf life and the highest price value, around 10 and 15 euros per liter. So we named this project Phoenix 2020, and uh, the Latin motto of Phoenix uh, was uh, post fata resurgo. And that's the wish I give you all, uh, that it means uh, after difficult times, uh, I come back to life. So thank you. Wonderful. Oh, Matteo, this is so good. I, and I love the, following the development of the spiritual machine. And when I heard about it the first time, I was kind of, what is this? And then you realize that, oh shit, I cannot drain all the different spirits in the world because there is a limitless amount of them out there and then you get kind of nervous if you're if you're into the good stuff that you're actually producing. And I've had some of it, it's like, it's beyond, of course, it's really good. Uh, and, and then of course, everyone can have their own spirit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, I remember you were the really first fan of the spiritual machine, so thank you for uh, all your support, your honor, it's really important. And I think that that's uh, the most interesting part. So uh, you have just to think about uh, uh, an idea and uh, then uh, we work uh, with, uh, with you and uh, we have also a community of uh, 3,000 bartenders that can test your product. So we are more than just a bottler. We create the re recipe with you and we help you in distributing and promoting it. So the platform. Another reason to become a bartender. Thank you so much, Matteo. Uh, looking forward to seeing you soon again. Take care, yeah. have a wonderful day. See you. Yeah, are you here? Uh, let's throw you into the equation. Yes, here is Matthias. Hello. So, good to see you. How are you? I'm good, my friend. Thank you. Let me just share my screen because I have some things to show. There you go. Do you see it? Yeah, and I'll, I'll double click it so we see it. Uh, so, well, here you are. Uh, we see your screen now. Perfect. So, yeah. my name is uh, Matthias. I'm the country manager for the Swiss digital automation tool called Nanos. Nanos is a platform that makes. It... Yeah. So, sorry, you, you probably have to share not just your screen, but uh, the content also. So if you. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Perfect. So this is the website of Nanos. Now, Nanos is powered by machine learning. I'm not going to tell you so much about that because we do not have much time. So if you want to learn more what that actually means, you can simply read it in the website. Now, what I have been doing is focusing on helping as many businesses as possible with digitalization, with promoting their products and services online. And especially in the time of COVID, there were so many restaurants who were looking to go online, but they just didn't know how to do that. Uh, as you see in Google Trends, which uh, March for several hundred percent. Uh, so that is what I focus on. Now, when you're using Nanos and running ads, you will see your dashboard like this. So this will be my personal dashboard. And uh, I'll just jump into how it actually works when a business is creating ads for Google, Facebook, and Instagram without actually having an account in either of the platform. All you need is an account is Nanos. Uh, now, let's say, hypothetically, my friend who is running a sushi restaurant called me and says, uh, Matt, I have Poke Bowl now. Can you help me to promote it to my customers locally? I will say, sure. So I'll look up his ad, which I've been helping him before. So here it is. I'll simply click on it and I will go to controls. I'll click duplicate, which will make a copy of that, all the settings that I already set before. Uh, now it will come to the draft. I'll just open it up. So this will be the first page when you actually create an ad. Uh, now here you see that I marked it as the Pokeball ad, so that I have some organization in my dashboard. 
have selected that it is for his business, the Umi and Pau in Bellingby. You click next, you will come to the page where you actually set the audience. So uh, his client will be typical 20 to 60, both male and female, on both platforms. Speaking English, since I will set the keywords in English, I will choose the English language. However, I do recommend that you create a separate ad for Swedish and Swedish keywords. Do not mix languages when you're running uh, ad online. That's like a basic marketing rule. Now, I obviously have set the area that are relevant to his uh, the, uh, surroundings. It will be the, the local areas around his restaurant because that's where I want his ad to be seen at to, to have the highest impact. So the next page, you select the platforms. Um, and uh, yeah, so also, let me go back. LinkedIn and Twitter will also come quite soon. So then you'll be able to run ads on the five major platforms very easily in just five minutes. So in this page, you actually describe what you are promoting. So this will be sushi, Asian, Thai food, and I've added poke bowl now to it, uh, just to save us some time. So the thing is, you can just stop there and simply uh, describe here what it is you're selling. So in, here I will describe where well, we are selling poke bowl in Vellingby, and that's it. Then the nano marketers will automatically set the keywords for you. However, I will teach you how to only do that since in the end you know your business best. And you know your competitors best. Yeah. No, no, but okay. So, so I, I get this. So this is a really smart tool because most of the people are out there working with with the hospitality, no, they're not well, well versed when it comes to digital media. So they really need these types of technologies out there. Uh, so this is super cool. So um, now, how many people have you onboarded so far? How many are you how many people have onboarded? Yeah. Well, we actually didn't plan to come to Sweden. However, since I'm in Sweden, I've been had running a few restaurants for myself, and I was working for Nanos at the, this period of time. I encourage them to quickly launch it in Sweden because it's needed right now. Businesses and special restaurants do need to go online now running ads. So we've been here since March. But we are all over the world, and we're being used in almost all countries. Lovely. Okay, so everyone understand where you're supposed to go in order to make sure that your campaigns are great. Thank you so much for sharing, Matthias. Uh, we will move on now in the program, uh, but you guys out there, you know where to go when you want to run a good campaign. Yeah. Thank you. The, the document where they will have the link and uh, more description of what I've been talking about if they want to learn more. Cool. Check out the chat. Okay, take care. Thanks you very much. Yes. We have you here. Yes, uh, nice to be here. Nice to have you here. So, uh, tell us. Yes, I will. So, uh, can you see me and my screen? We can. Beautiful. So, my name is Christopher, and I'm one of the co-founders of Climato. As you probably heard today, the food industry stands for 25% of the global emissions. Luckily, consumer trends are changing rapidly, and people are demanding more sustainable food and want to buy product from transparent companies. Because of these two reasons, me and my three colleagues started Climato. So what is Climato? We have developed a digital tool to give the restaurants, hotels and schools and all kinds of companies serving food the opportunity to work with sustainability by calculating, communicating and calibrating the climate impact of food. In our tool, restaurants can easily feed in their menus and get the climate impact of these different recipes. After that, they can display or present the climate impact on their menu or their website. As you can see here on the example menu, um, there is a symbol indicating if, if the meal has a low, medium or high climate, climate impact and a number presenting the CO2 footprint. So we want to help guests at restaurants to make more informed food choices and help them to eat more sustainable. Furthermore, we give all the restaurants the opportunity to generate monthly sustainability reports so they can follow their emissions over time, involve their guests and their colleagues in their sustainability work 
and of course display how much CO2 they reduce every month. So I will give you a very quick demo of how the application works. I just logged into the tool and wrote chicken salad. So now I'm gonna calculate the, rest, the climate impact of a chicken salad. So I write chicken breast, choose Scandinavia, 200 grams, some tomatoes, organic from Spain, 100 grams, and some pasta, obviously, from Italy, 100 grams. This chicken salad with these particular ingredients, with those uh, country of regions, has a carbon footprint of 0 0.6 uh, carbon emissions. If you perhaps would change the chicken to beef instead, the value would, of course, go up. It's almost um, tripled. And if you take away the beef and perhaps, perhaps add some beans instead, some green beans, the value would go down. Only zero dollars. Cool, Christopher. I think, I think uh, yeah, this is cool. This is really easy to use. A lot of people yeah. started to use it also, right, in order to, to calculate everything. Yeah, we got uh, over 100 restaurants now in Sweden, Norway, and uh, starting up a little bit in the UK as well. That's sweet. And, uh, and uh, from where do you get your data? We work with uh, uh, a research organization called Research Institute of Sweden, RISE, usually called. We have a close partnership with them where we help their science. We like the bridge between their science and the restaurants and the consumers. Okay, so lovely. So this is proper science turned into something really useful for all the restaurants out there so that we as consumers can be happier and less carbon emitting. Is exactly, Joe. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Climato, yeah. easy to remember, you know where to go if you want to calculate your meals. Uh, see you around, Christopher. Let's move over to the next uh, and final, actually, speaker of the day here. Uh, Akantru, uh, welcome from Puli. Thank you. Thank you. So basically, the camera is yours. It's over there. And uh, All right. let's share a screen, if we can. Uh, and uh, go here and here and go share. All right. I think we're in. You're in. All right, so uh, I am Akanshu and I'm from Puli. During my high school days, uh, my father used to own a restaurant. And uh, once I visited his uh, back kitchen and there I see the chef crying and I was like, what's happening? And he's like, I'm trying to chop the onions. And fast forward 10 years here, I'm at KTH studying robotics and trying to still work on that solution of making him not cry. So introducing you to the chef assistant robot working alongside humans. So it's a safe environment for robotics and human, and we'll be assisting humans in creating better products and chefs creating better meals. So uh, essentially right now, as we approach the out of COVID, uh, uh, optimistically speaking, and then uh, we go towards a world wherein we are more occupied we see a trend wherein the full service restaurants are increasing, but uh, with the increase in the restaurants, there is a decrease in the amount of available help to the chefs in the back kitchen uh, happening in, the, in this world. So we are essentially pitching in there that the workforce uh, is decreasing in the back kitchen and we as assistive chef, uh, assistive chef technology helps the chef to create uh, a better meal. So we believe that a chef is a Picasso on a canvas and if we levy his or her creativity then we essentially be able to create delicious meals out of hopefully sustainable food. So there's an average industry turnover of 75 percent essentially people moving out of back uh, kitchen uh, force and this goes up to 300 percent wherein frying is required such as uh, uh, potatoes and that's wherein we are saying that we will help you. So yeah, with fully we envision a 0% estimated shortage in the staff and then 0% average turnover. And since we are not working or our business model is not based just around Michelin star restaurant, we are trying to help you or help 
people grow in their full service restaurants. So we try to increase the number of full service restaurants as well. So there are uh, people working in this space, but we are different from them. So uh, there's Molly and Spice working in actually completely automating the solution. We don't want to take the human's creativity out of the loop. Like I said, it's the Picasso that matters and not the tools he used. Or, and then there's uh, Miso and uh, CapEx. We're working on a very small problem, which essentially takes the business out of the loop and doesn't have uh, or make the businesses profitable thereby just being a very flashy technological product. So yeah, the solution is fully. Like I said, we are working on uh, generic food cutting. We offer predictive maintenance so that our supply chain is very nice. And then we want to assist you in pick and place. And then we collaborate with humans. We assist them. We are not take away, taking away jobs. There's just a vacuum that we are trying to fill. And believe me, as soon as we are done with the vacuum, we are pretty good. Uh, yeah, something more. And there's some technology. We are working with a few labs, research labs here at KTH and then at Oregon State University. And we are essentially working with artificial intelligence that is used in Siri and Google. Uh, and then uh, we are trying to utilize that technology in order to give you generic food cutting, essentially making it a more business viable proposition. Cool. And then there's our team. And yeah, we are looking for pre seed round. Thank you. Thank you, Akasha. Really cool to have you here. And uh, really good to see someone solving the pro problem of chopping onions. I really would need yeah. that because I've been crying so much. I love that all the time. So thank you for coming here in person, I can show, and I hope yeah, to see you up there as well with some property chopped, I hope. Yeah. Uh, onions and, and other things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Yeah, cool. So we're moving into the last piece of this uh, this day here, which is a fantastic discussion I've been waiting to have with Chef Pierre Tian and uh, and Paul Newham, uh, both of the SDG2 advocacy uh, initiative. Hey, there you are, guys. So good to see you. So tell me, where in the world are you now? Paul, you're, you're, in, you're in Australia, right? Yeah, I'm in Australia. So I'm in Melbourne, Australia. I wish I was there in Stockholm with you, but I'm in Melbourne, Australia. So it's, it's, it's heading towards midnight. So apologies for the, the bright lights in my face, but that's too uh, <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you for being up so late for, our, for us. Uh, Chef, where are you? I'm in California. In the Bay Area, near Brown. Oh, good, good. There is a lot of light too, but that comes from flaming forests, right? Or is it okay now? <laughs> it's nice. All our biodiversity is burning right now. It's, it's too bad. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we're here for the final session uh, regarding urban food systems going forward. And now, Paul, I, I would have you have to have you start a little bit telling you. What is this SDG2 Advocacy Hub? Yeah, so um, Johan, the, the SDG2 Advocacy Hub helps to support um, the advocacy around Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is what the SDG stands for. It's not an STD, it's an SDG, um, which is the, the goals that every country in the world signed on to in 2015. And the goal is really around um, feeding people around the world, helping to do that in a nutritious way, um, that looks after smallholder farmers in a climate sensitive manner and looks after the biodiversity in our world. And so what we do is we work with private sector, UN, civil society around the world to help coordinate how we come up with messages that, that punch through. And one of the groups we partner really strongly with is a group of chefs, um, chefs that have uh, connected to this framework called the Chefs Manifesto, which talks about all kinds of different issues. And they're chefs who are entrepreneurs, that run restaurants, that run businesses in different parts of the world. And Pierre is uh, a member of that network and uh, making a really significant change um, in the work that he's doing, um, particularly around biodiversity, around smallholder farmers, um, but also in just creating an amazing, amazing flavors and taste and introducing people to new ingredients in uh, urban environments where they don't necessarily have access to walk out onto a farm and get them. 
Hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Because this, thank you for summing it up, Paul. And it's uh, to us, these are, are of course sweet words to hear because everything we do, we stand on the back bedrock of biodiversity. And I actually had this interview with Marcus Samuelson coming up soon as well in one of our channels. He's a great chef in New York talking about how he converted his top restaurant, the Red Rooster in Harlem, to become a community kitchen. And he saw yeah. himself as reinventing uh, himself as a player in the hospitality sector to be a, a community leader instead of a respirator. And, and to me, I think that's, that's playing into the question here. What is hospitality in the future? Is it a restaurant? What do chefs do in order to make this planet you know, a healthier, more sustainable place to be in? And, uh, and how do we create the new models around that? And, yeah. uh, yeah, and, and Chef Pierre, I mean, since I have heard so much about you and, and I've never been able to go to one of your restaurants, but it works, you know, <laughs> it, it really is a place I would like to go because you're cooking and teaching the rest of the world West African cuisine, if I understand correctly, and, uh, and how you can use that in order to promote not just cultural knowledge, but also new, new tastes. Yeah. Can you elaborate on what you're doing? That would be super fun to hear. Um, yeah, it's a question. What, what am I doing? Uh, so many hats. Indeed, I'm part of this network. <laughs> 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 well, I start with being a chef. Okay, I, I'm from Senegal, just uh, the, for context. And um, as a chef based in New York, I have a restaurant in New York, and I always uh, thought of uh, New York is not complete as being called the food, food capital of the world. And at the time, it was missing the African component. So that's how this mission started with me. I was like, well, you know, bringing African cuisine in New York could be a mission, and bringing it in a way that's wholesome. Um, when we talk about cuisine, oftentimes, us chefs, you know, we, we finish with uh, the, 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 our art form, but we we forget to connect it. We got to connect it with the source of the food, you know, with with the farmers, with the you know the, the fishermen, with the producers, the humble ones. Who, without them, there's no food. And in particular, in where my cuisine is from, my cuisine is inspired by West African tradition, culinary tradition. And those people who are at the origin of that cuisine, they are among the poorest people in the world. You know, if you go to rural West Africa, where I'm from, particularly a region called the Sahel, you know, those, that region is, is affected by so many uh, issues, you know, uh, immigration, everyone is gone because there's no job opportunities, you know, the farmers have, you know, issues with just finding market for the crops, and that's where I fit in, I thought as a chef in, uh, based in New York City, I could find markets for the crops, if it was and in doing so, save biodiversity because those crops that don't have markets, they tend to disappear. And I've seen that phenomenon happening over the years. I've been in New York for three decades now. And every time I go back to Senegal, you know, some, some things that I used to see as a kid are no longer available because they, they just simply vanish. So that's how I started my company called Yolele. And this company, the mission was to work with all the farmers and introduce their crops to new markets, you know, starting with my restaurants, you know, and those crops are important for me because without them, I cannot bring those flavors that are, you know, that, that are about my cuisine. So we started with a, with a crop called Ponyu, that's an ancient grain that's been around for over 5,000 years. But that crop was only existent in the rural area where it's been, it was being grown. Even cities like Dakar didn't really have any market for that crop. So, and and uh, and to make a long story short, you know, we open we open market for that in the started with New York City, and today we are distributing it across the U.S. and it's growing. We added five new products, and each product that we are adding are products that are underutilized in 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 West Africa that are produced by farmers from that region. And the goal is to really bring op opportunity, economic opportunity. But also doing it in a way that mindful of the environment. Those crops are drought resistant. You know, we're looking at crops that are not only drought resistant, but but uh, the agriculture is done in a regenerative way. That 
you know, this just the way it's done traditionally in rotation. We don't want to promote just one crop and then the farmers would think of it as a cash crop and, and just ignore the other crop that used to be done traditionally. So we're supporting a rotation way of, of uh, practicing agriculture by opening markets to all those different crops that are exist in the region. So in brief, that's what I do with the market with Fonio and uh, at my restaurant in Yole, at Yolele, which is Ateranga, which is the fast casual restaurant. I also offer those same crops for the consumers who are looking for, for healthy, nutri nourish nourishing products, but they're not going to go to Whole Foods, for instance, and buy the grain and, and cook it for themselves. So they can come to the restaurant and experience it themselves and have a new flavor, a new taste, and come and have like, uh, uh, an experience of West Africa at the restaurant, and then they're convinced they can go buy the food by themselves. Thank you. That's awesome, Pierre. You're on, are you there? Oh, yeah. Perfect. So basically, that's 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 a, a little summary of what I'm doing. So I'm doing it at different levels too, through my cookbooks as well. My my last cookbook was focusing on that grain. That was a single ingredient cookbook. It was called the Fonio Cookbook, and I just wanted the yeah. the reader to have all the information from the source to the to the to the plate, you know. And we documented farmers how they how they yeah. growing the harvesting the processing and the recipes it's more complete yeah. more complete vision absolutely i mean to me i what i love about that pierre i'm i'm not sure if your hands uh connection is working um what i love about the work that you do is that you do look at the system and I think it's really important to look at the system because often, you know, there's so many things in our food system, especially at a city level, that are invisible. And um, one of the things of COVID, I think, is that some of these invisible things that we often don't see in our city's food systems have become visible, where you've all of a sudden seen now things like supply chain issues breaking down. You've seen these kinds of things. But what you do is you tell the story of where the food comes from. You also then provide it so you can cook it at home but then you also provide that experience for people in a city who want that pre-made option that that fast casual concept something they can t grab quickly and bite and you know it's also cool and and johan it'd be it's good for you to know you know pierre's restaurant is just up the road from uh marcus's restaurant in harlem as well um mm -hmm. at the the africa yep. center is that right yeah cool, that's right so that, that's yeah. And so these guys are all have been responding to the COVID situation there and helping and, and really flipping the model um, to kind of respond for the, the need and trying to keep it open over that time has been challenging for, for many chefs in New York City with such a mass migration of people outside of this to leaving the city, but then also the challenge exactly. for, for the those people, that have also For the people been, remaining, so I think that was also physical. the message of Marcus. I mean, like leaving is yeah. a privilege in a sense. But there are many first responders and others yeah. staying in the city because they don't have any other way, you know, anywhere to go. Um, how do you cook? How do you cook? How do you feed yeah. them in a good and healthy way? And, and sorry, sorry for being thrown out of the discussion a while. We did some changing of computers on the fly here. Apparently, it worked. So, so technology is good for something. Um, no, but I, I was kind of wondering here because to me, it's always been the case that hospitality has the key. To the next gen healthy and sustainable food system but the problem with hospitality is it hasn't reached enough people yet because hospitality has still be seen as you know fancy dining and that's where you got all this this good stuff that was inaccessible to a lot of people and the question now for me is how sustainable or how hospitality can actually reach out and bring those good farmers out that the good produce, all the stuff you haven't tasted yet that is good for you and the planet and serve it in a good way. So to me, kind of it's needed some sort of flipping of the entire hospitality sector in order to provide this. And you, you, you're into this, Paul. I mean, like you, you mentioned the word flipping yourself. Uh, I'm just wondering, when you see the world from the hospitality perspective, say 10 years into the future, what do you see then? What will it look like? 
Is that a question for, for me or for Paul? Yeah, well, both of you guys. I mean, this like, is something both to, it's good to hear from, right, from right. the chef. <laughs> okay, well, sorry. Um, well, for me, for me, I, I see it right here. I mean, COVID is, has opened that door for us. You know, it, it was very scary. It's very scary still for the industry. But, um, you know, I really see it as an opportunity. And, and the opportunity can even be a great opportunity. Sometimes from the crisis, something major can come out of it. And, and for us, we just let ourselves be guided in an organic way. You know, the, our restaurant is located in Harlem and uh, it happened coincidentally that we, we located near hospitals, major hospitals actually, that were dealing with COVID-19 on the, like really on the front, front line. And, uh, and we became first responders because uh, um, first responders, we, feed, we, we started feeding first responders because there were, many of them were already coming to the restaurant. And, and it started, it became something that, you know, we, we talked about it, the, the hospital reached out to us and we organized the front and the restaurant started chunking food, you know, like by the house on a daily yeah. basis to feed the hospital workers. And then it, we were like, we can do more than this. You know, it was something that, you know, was celebrated. Both the, the, the hospital workers were like posting the food when it was arriving. They were posting in social media, posing. I mean, they, they just loved it. And then we realized that, you know, I mean, that's great. You know, we're feeding those doctors and nurses, but they, they, they don't really have any problem feeding themselves. They, 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 they're getting paid, you know, but we live in Harlem. And there's another reality in Harlem. We have shelters with kids in Harlem who only relied on school to have food, school lunch, you know, and schools are closed now. How are they doing? So we worked with, we collaborated with an organization called Harlem Grown, and they connected us with those shelters. And we started bringing food to those kids who are living in shelters and who don't really have access to, to, to food. And that was big, that was a new program and people were supporting it. People could just click a button and buy food for those kids through the restaurant. And, and it was another way to reach a whole other audience and feel good about it because we were really feeding kids nutritious food, you know, because that's what we're about, bringing nutritious food to the market and those kids will uh, as you may or may not know you know new york city school system the food is not ideal you know and, and they you know often time you can even call it poison and and so yeah. so we were, we were changing the system with our food and doing good and at the same time it was good for us because we allowed me to keep some employees on the payroll and allowed the restaurant to stay open and I think the future is that I don't want to change and return to what we were. You know, I really want to keep going into the community. And the community gave it back to us. The community is very supportive. The community has been doing, when we were only doing deliveries and takeout, that was the community really supporting us. Our deliveries and takeouts really hit levels that we never thought of when we were, you know, doing what we were doing well as a restaurant. So that's just, you know, I think, you know, this is where. The, the industry is going and um, you know long story to the long way to say you know I'm, I'm, I'm really confident that it's going to be more about the community and more about hospitality in the traditional way but yeah. it exactly because yeah. what you're talking about now is not just reinventing the chef but also reinventing the way a city operates uh with the help of chefs and the help of food yeah and hopefully create a new society that's more inclusive, more biodiversity oriented, and well, basically tastes better too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So cool. But I think, I think, I think, Johan, one of the things I would just add is that it's it's more than like food is food is definitely about flavor and taste. It's definitely about nutrition, but it's also about the spaces. And I think restaurants in the future, you know, rest restaurants in the past have been places where we meet and gather. And in a world where we struggle to be able to be in that proximity, it's really interesting to see what does that mean. So it's a place where you come, restaurants are thinking about how do they sell products that people take home? How do you, um, so I'd love to see this kind of shift also around thinking about how do you educate people in restaurants? How do you educate them so that they can better prepare at home? Because if they can, you know, a chef can demonstrate at a restaurant what to eat. 
But if somebody's taking something home, you know, they don't want to just be microwaving it and whatever. You need to teach them how to engage with the ingredients. And so I think chef, the, the restaurant experience can be more about the, the experience, the learning, the coming together in smaller groups to be able to then take that back and replicate that in other spaces, whether that's being in, in, at home or in you know, schools or different places. And so I think there's that. And then I also think there's the way that, that goods are distributed. There's a lot of restaurant space those restaurants now are, are diversifying, selling things. They're, 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 they're moving into multiple business models to make, just make it viable. And I think that viability is a real, you know, will create all kinds of innovation and opportunity, you know, and Chef Pierre is a great example. He has his own business, he, that he has multiple restaurants, cookbook, education, online, but then he's also selling products and he's, he's, he's bringing products into the country and then he's got his whole product line and you know and to me that shows kind of i think part of what the future will be where there's a lot more connectedness in storytelling going on through integrated approaches that's cool paul i, I think that actually has to be the last words of this session because we run over time <laughs> as, 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 as happens, you know, sometimes every now and then when the conversations are interesting, uh, we can agree upon one thing, and that is that the hospitality sector has changed through COVID. And we, we actually have reason to believe and hope it is for the better. Uh, and, uh, and I wish you gentlemen the best of luck with all your future endeavors. Yeah, it was a great pleasure talking to you. I look forward to, to a longer conversation some other time. Paul, I'll see you again tomorrow. Uh, and to the best to the both of you. Have a wonderful evening or day, wherever you are in the world. Take care. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. See Good ya. night, Paul. Bye. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs>